I'm Quayla Nassar. Let's see, he was a spiritualist, he was a teacher, a social radical, and he was also the nice guy next door. Those are just some of the descriptions of Jesus Christ. So who was the real Jesus? We have our guest tonight is Father Thomas Hopko, who's with us. He's going to be talking to John Rigetti. Father Thomas is the former dean of St. Vladimir's Seminary. He's also a renowned theologian of the Orthodox faith, an author, and of course, one of our favorite guests here for us on Orthodoxy Now. So let's see, who's the real Jesus? I wonder if it'll answer your question. I'm John Rigetti, and my guest is Father Thomas Hopko. Father, always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Today's topic, who is the real Jesus? You know, we have so many components, so many understandings of who Jesus is. So let me just start with who is this Jesus we talk about? Well, <clears throat> it, was, it, it was a controversy from the very beginning. It was a controversy when he was uh, alive, who are you? Where did this man come from? Where did you come from? Who is your mother? If you read the Gospels, that's what you discover. And then, of course, after he is crucified and then the tomb is empty and the claim is that he's raised and glorified, then there was just an explosion of questions. Who is he? And, and sometimes people, uh, especially Orthodox, I think, sometimes give a misleading picture uh, they give the impression that it was very, very clear who Jesus was in the beginning, and then little by little people started going off in this direction, going off in that direction. I don't think that's accurate. There was controversy about Jesus from the beginning. There was controversy among the apostles about Jesus. Uh, there, there are controversies among the Jews uh, themselves. Probably even St. John's writings had a lot to do with a controversy among Jews. There may have been Jews who said, yeah, he's really the Messianic king, and he's going to come back and establish Israel, but he's not God's son. He's not the incarnate Logos. Uh, he is not divine. All this business about eating his body and blood is ridiculous, you know, and so on. So there was a, a, a real clash about who Jesus was from the beginning. And of course, now, I mean, if you look at television, you look whatever, you can find, as Quaylen said uh, as she was beginning the, the program today, for some, Jesus is a social revolutionary. For others, he's a, a contemplative mystic. For another one, he's just a nice fellow who goes around being nice to everybody. Uh, on the other hand, he's a, a misguided person who didn't know what was, he was doing. Maybe he was a prophet who was wrong or whatever. Uh, so there's all kinds of, of controversy. However, uh, the Eastern Orthodox tradition uh, has a very, very clear I believe, very clear understanding who this Jesus is. Uh, and, and it comes from the witness of those who were with him and from the Old Testament. <laughs> from before, the Old Testament. Before we get to how we, the Orthodox, understand him, let's step back on some of these identifiers you've given Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ as Jew. Uh, let's put him in the context of the times and the religion. Is he a good Jew? Uh, Jesus is definitely a Jew, no doubt about it. His mother is a Jew in the house of David. I mean, you cannot understand Jesus without understanding the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. And as a matter of fact, that's where, for us Orthodox, the real Jesus comes through. Because what's so interesting about, let's say, Gnostic writings about Jesus or, or, or Montanists and some of the early heretical groups is they separated him from the Old Old Testament, whereas the Apostle Paul became totally convinced that Jesus was foretold in the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. After, after Paul had this vision of the risen Christ, he never preached by vision. He went and looked at the scriptures and said, oh my God, it's all there. Yeah. It's all there. And so actually the titles of Jesus are all connected to the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. He is the new Adam. He is the seed of Abraham. He is the new Moses. He is the one whom the prophets spoke about. He is the suffering servant. He is the king. He is the, he is the, the, the reject. Uh, you know, and, and I think that there's good reason why uh, there's a lot of uh, versions of Jesus because if Jesus really is everything, if he really is the new Adam and, and really is everything, he is the teacher and the disciple. He is the high priest and the victim. 
He is the pastor and the lamb. He is God and the son of God. And he's one of us, a real human being. And, and so you could just about, I mean, he's very good raw material to make from him whatever you want. And of course, uh, that's what often people do. They make of him whatever they want. Now, in the New Testament, especially Christ himself, often refers to himself as the son of man. What does that title mean? Well, it's a controverted title, but I think what, what, what the real important son of man is the two most quoted sentences of the Old Testament in the New. I mean, if we had a trivia pursuit game and said, what are the two most quoted sentences of the Old Testament in the New? It would be a conflation of Daniel 7 and Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put all the enemies under your feet. But the one who sits at the right hand of God, Elohim, Yahweh, is the Son of Man. The Son of Man in Daniel, who is presented to God and is given all power, majesty, glory, and honor, and is made the head over all things. And of course, the key point for, for Orthodox is he becomes the head over all things through what he suffers. And the key point is he's the suffering servant who becomes the messianic high priest, the messianic prophet, the messianic mm -hmm. king. And, and we believe that all this is already in the New Testament writings. You know, I think uh, scholars, uh, at least, for example, Martin Hengel, a wonderful scholar, he said all of the teachings about who the real Jesus is have been given by the end of the first century. The, the other 2,000 years is a footnote. Nice. You know, I mean, about the Nicene Council and light from light and true God of true God and son of God. And, but all those titles are already there. And, you know, we were speaking on this program about why uh, the crucified Messiah, why, why he had to be killed. But it's so interesting in the passion stories, the end of the story always is when he says to the high priests, you will see the son of man come in power on the clouds with all the angels as the glorious ruler of the universe. And it says they rip their garments and decide to kill him. So, so the son of man, it's a messianic title. It's a is messianic it, is title. Is it so that we identify more closely with him? Is it to talk about his human nature? I, I don't think so exactly. You see this whole human nature, divine nature, it's, that's, that's a later way of formulating I things, see. you see. Uh, but what is certainly true is that according to what we would call the canonical Gospels. And the canonical Gospels for us are the real Jesus. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John, which is very different. But in any case, the claim is that the canon of faith of the community that we identify with say, these books are the true ones. This is the real Jesus. And what makes those books different from the other books, and there are plenty of other writings about Jesus, even attributed to apostles from the earliest time, is that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and certainly Paul, and the entire New Testament, certainly the Apocalypse, Jesus is the crucified one. But he's the crucified one to whom are attributed all of the attributes that the law, the Psalms, and the prophets attribute to God. It's an most amazing thing. In fact, it, 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 this is not only what the canonic Gospels say, this is the Gospel. This, the gospel is that this man, Jesus, who is a real human being, real, that's a dogma for Eastern Orthodoxy, real human being, he's the real human being who is divine, who is really divine with the same divinity as God. And, and, and when, he, when he was on earth, he took all the divine prerogatives. He worked on Sabbath. And he did all the messianic signs, walked on the water, you know, calmed the winds, cast out the demons, uh, acted uh, 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 with power and authority. And he did it in his own name. He did it in his own name. Very often he says, Father, I'm praying to you, but I don't have to do this. You know, you are with me always and so on. So the key is, what is this man's relationship to the one real and true God? And the ultimate conclusion uh, 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 from the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. And don't forget that the risen Lord opens the minds of those who believe in him to understand the scripture, is that this man who was crucified, who's a real man, is also really God's son in the most unique, only son that God has. And so when you would say to him, who's his mother? It's Mary. 
Who's his father? God. Well, he's born of Mary now in time. When did God beget him if he is the father? Well, the creedal answer from the scripture would be before all ages. <laughs> Begotten of the father before all yeah, ages, right, sure. born on earth. So the real Jesus for us is a real human being who's also really divine. And that's where you get the language of the two natures. He has all the qualities of God, identical, not similar, but the same, according to the Orthodox Church Fathers, the same. Like St. Basil said, if he's similar to God, in what is he different? And the answer would be only in that he's another person from God, he's God's son, and he is also a human being. That's how he differs. But when it comes to his qualities, his divinity, his power, it's identical to God's. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same, yeah. Okay. That, that's, what, that's how the doctrine developed. Now, of course, what happens now is you have um, a revival of all these uh, early Christian writings about Jesus, you know, all these Gospels that come out all the time, and they were known. You know, I recently was <laughs> giving a talk in a, in a, in a church in, in Winnipeg, in Manitoba, during Lent, and we were talking about this issue of these other writings about Jesus in the early church and today. And this one fellow, he said, you can go on television <laughs> and you can see a program called The Lost Books of the Bible. And then the allegation is they're teaching what Jesus really was, how he was, and so on. And as one fellow said uh, at the conference, he said it perfectly. He said, they say the lost books of the Bible. Well, they were never lost. They were known from the earliest times. All the church fathers knew about those books, and they were never of the Bible. Right. They were never put in the Bible from right. the beginning. They're external writings. They were external writings. Absolutely. Listen, so, Father, we're going to close this section out, but we're going to be coming back and okay. talking a lot more about this, and hopefully for the, our viewers, definitively declare this is who Jesus Christ is. Let's give it a try. Okay. Okay. Why do the Orthodox use three fingers to make the sign of the cross? The three fingers symbolize the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The two fingers folded down signify the divine and human natures of Christ. Until some time after 1204, it was the other way round. Two fingers straight out, three held down, as is still practiced by Russian old ritualists. I'm Quayla Nassar, and I have a special guest. Now, John Rigetti is going to be the guest. You're in the hot seat right now, John, yeah, because... Is, what a that's, change. I know. <laughs> but, you know, we really thought that folks don't know as much about you as, you know, there is about you. And, and we're talking about who is the real Jesus. And so what I want to ask you is, what role does Jesus play in your life? Well, I have to say to you, Quaylin, that Jesus has always played a key role in my life. In fact, many people um, have often said to me, and you know, some religious traditions talk about being saved. When they say, when were you saved? I say to them, there wasn't a moment of salvation. I have always had in my life the pleasure of a relationship with God. And most especially with Jesus, who, um, who I almost view as a, a friend, someone that I, I talk with with great frequency. Great frequency is that lots of times during the day? It sure is. Um, any quiet times I can steal, um, particularly at work. I, just, you know, I have <laughs> children, and when you're raising children, there are great, great challenges with that. And many times I turn to Jesus and say, what's the answer here, or how do I handle this? And, um, and I'm happy to report, <laughs> as you might suspect, there's always an answer. Now let's talk about your family life, because I know that you have children and your wife, and you're all very active in church. How are your children taking to that as well? Well, you know, when you're raising children, I think one of the biggest challenges as an Orthodox parent is to help them understand the role of Christ within their everyday lives, to not leave Jesus in the liturgy or to leave Jesus in the church. That this is, and in fact, jokingly, sometimes as we're driving home from church and they're bickering, I say to them, why do you even, why do you people even go to church, you know, <laughs> and constantly say to them in the car, listen, as siblings, as you deal with one another, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus respond to that? You have to, I think, make Jesus 
live in the household for your children. He can't be a Sunday visitor. He has mm. to be a, a member of your family. He has to be with you all the time. I wonder what the kids say when, you, when they go, oh God, dad's gone this again. Well, yeah, and then you know what you do discover is as they age, believe it or not, some of those things you said actually did sink in. <laughs> Now, you're in public relations, and you have a balance of, you talked about how moments at work and so forth, and people think of public relations as all, quote, spin. So how do you balance that, and how do people view that? Well, uh, when you take it, a career like public relations, where you're interacting with people all the time, where you have to think quickly on your feet, when there are things like issues that you have to manage, this is a place where I rely heavily on Jesus. And I also rely heavily on Jesus within the context of the Trinity. I mean, so we're talking about Jesus, but I don't ever separate Him from God the Father or from the Holy Spirit. And I actually call upon each of them. Um, and I don't. If you said to me, "How do you know when you call on which?" I just do. Yeah. And I suspect it is God guiding me to those various persons for various reasons. In the context of the business world and dealing with public relations, I find oftentimes that when I call on Jesus that the answer I'm seeking is there for me. So if I'm presented with a particular challenge or here's a public issue that has to be addressed, uh, many times the spin, the direction it has to be given, I find in that conversation with Christ. And so it doesn't become so much spin. And so here you are, you have these many facets of your life and we've talked about all of the different roles that, that Jesus has been described as, as you and Father Tom have been talking about. And uh, obviously you've shown us in an everyday way that that plays into your life. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thanks. We're going to go right back to Father Tom Hopko and John Rigetti, who's going back in this chair, to talk a little bit more about who is the real Jesus. Why is Easter celebrated on a different Sunday each year? Jesus Christ's passion and resurrection occurred during the Jewish Passover. Therefore, Christians follow the Jewish calendar and celebrate Easter on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. The Orthodox also take seriously the ancient rule that the Christian Passover must follow the Jewish feast and not precede it. So in some years, it may fall much later than in others. Hi, we're back with Father Thomas Hopko, and we're talking about who is the real Jesus. Uh, we covered a lot in the first segment. Uh, Quay Lynn and I had an opportunity to talk about the role of Jesus in a, a layman's life, in this instance, my life. But um, let's get back to the real issue here, if we can define for people. So who is the real Jesus? Who is the real Christ? Well, I think, you know, when people say, uh, who is Jesus for you? Sometimes I think we ought to say, who am I for Jesus? <laughs> That's much more interesting. If there is a real Jesus and that I'm going to have to answer to him, then it's much more important what he thinks of me than what I think of him. Uh, but in any case, what do we think of him? Because there's this controversy. Here I think we would simply say, certainly for orthodoxy, the real Jesus for us is the scriptural Jesus. It's, it's the Jesus of the scriptures, that we believe are according to the canon of faith. The so canon of faith is first. So let's define him then. Use the scripture and okay. define him. All right. And so that would mean that to, to, to know him, and, and how do you define a living being? How would I define you? I mean, you have to have a, a, a contact with him. But the contact in contemplating the scripture in the community of faith where the claim is that He's alive through the Holy Spirit with us, illumining our minds to understand these scriptures, including the Old Testament scriptures. And the Old Testament scriptures are key. The Apostle Paul, before the Gospels were even written, was going around to communities, beginning with the Jews and then turning to the Gentiles, showing how from the scripture, kata tas grafas, according to what is written, that Jesus really is the Christ. Now, if, if you're giving a lesson to someone and say, well, I want to know about this. What do I do? Well, I think it's given even in the pages of the New Testament. Uh, certainly in St. John's Gospel, we had it last Sunday of this man born blind. The first contact is always with a man. You cannot jump to Jesus as God, one of the Holy Trinity, the Logos or whatever. 
you have Jesus of Nazareth. And that's how he emerges. He emerges preaching, teaching. He's a teacher, rabbi. That's his first title, rabbi. He comes out teaching, prophesying. And he doesn't emerge as with some great grandeur, but almost kind of just kind of walks into being. There was no will. grandeur. I mean, we should remember he only publicly preached for three years, and that was a time of no computers, no TV, no radio, no nothing. So who got to see him? Right. And, and there was words going around about him and what they're saying and so on. And it happened rather quickly. And some things that we think, for example, were huge, grandiose events, like, for example, his entry into the Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It probably took an hour with a bunch of kids in a crowd and it was over. And the apostles didn't even remember that it happened. <laughs> you know, so, so many things it says in the scripture, when he was raised and glorified, we remembered that he said that. We remembered that he did that. So there is through the lens of that, of that being raised and glorified. But as one of my students once said, the ha ha moment about the real Jesus is not the empty tomb. I mean, God could have done a miracle or whatever. The real ha ha moment is when you see that the whole Bible is about him. That he is the real Adam. He is Abraham's child. He is the son of David. He's the new Moses. He's the Passover lamb. He's the one whom the prophet spoke about. He is the, 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 the law itself, the logos, the davar Yahweh, the word of God. All those things come to him. But you got to begin with the man Jesus. And, and like that last Sunday's gospel, the, 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 the blind man, when they asked him, who did this? He said, the man Jesus. That's all he knew. He was this man. Then they start saying, well, who do you think he is? What did he do? And he says, maybe he's the prophet. Oh, now all of a sudden he's not just a man, he's the prophet. Prophet means the person inspired by God. Because whoever heard, he was a miracle worker. I was blind, now I see. So he does miracles. He's a prophet. They don't know where he comes from. Big controversy. And then at the end of the story, ninth chapter of John's Gospel, when he sees, Jesus comes to him and says, do you believe in the Son of God? And he said, who is he? Sir, Lord, and he says, you have seen him. And of course, that's a double meaning. Not only he, he's not blind anymore, but he understands. And it is he who speaks with you. And it says, and he believed and worshipped him. So he went from man to prophet to teacher to miracle worker to son of God. All within, you know, half a, a chapter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think that, that that's the way it has to go. And, and here, um, I, I'm absolutely convinced, and, and if there's any... Christian Sunday school teachers or something out there, don't begin with the Holy Trinity and three-leaf clovers and, and, and two natures and one nature and all that. Begin with the story. Begin with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Once you get that down, then you can go to John. <laughs> but you begin with the man and what he does and what he says, and it unfolds. It unfolds. And then finally, even on the last page of the of the New Testament of John's gospel, the theological gospel, you have the Apostle Thomas, my namesake. And by the way, I have a relic of him right here in my pocket, uh, of the Apostle Thomas. He says, my Lord and my God. That's the... That's the it was his aha moment. Uh, yeah, but seeing the risen Christ. But it's interesting that he is the Lord of me and the God of me. So he comes from... A, 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 a carpenter's son going around preaching and doing signs to being God's son and to being God. That's the New Testament. So we have to be relating to him. And we have to be very careful that we don't make him what we want him to be. But much more important, that we would become what he wants us to be <laughs> if there is the real Jesus. So uh, there is an order, there's a way, it's a struggle, it's blood, but it's basically the scripture and the prayer of the church in which that scripture is interpreted. So, so if I am to understand Jesus, and we have just 30 seconds left, then I understand Jesus in the context of how he is revealed through the scripture. Yes, and it's the scriptural. You know, in our Orthodox Church, we have all these grandiose services, you know, and all our priests and the people, they want to know, explain the liturgy, explain its symbolism, this and that. As an old man, I say to them, teach the people the scripture and you'll never have to have one lesson about the liturgy. The liturgy. It, it, our, our Jesus is the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Jude, Peter, and the apocalypse. That's our Jesus. 
And that's the Jesus of the church fathers. Because you can't even understand the Nicene Council and the Trinity. I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity begins with Peter's, with Jesus' question. Who do you say that I am? And by the way, Jesus didn't say, what do you think of my message? Or how do you relate to me as a person? Or how's your spiritual life growing? How do you think it'll go down? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or uh, how's your self-transformation going, Peter? He says, who do men say that I am? And then when Peter gives some answers, he says, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when that unfolds, you have the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. So if we want to understand, <laughs> That's how it begins. <laughs> we want to understand yeah. Jesus as Peter did, as Paul did, then the answer, the short answer is, then delve into the Scriptures. Find Him in the Scriptures. Yes, yeah. contemplate the Scriptures. Don't fight with them. Don't read them to, you know, refute your neighbor or, or the guy from the church down the street. Read it to see. In and fact, so, when we read it, we pray, Illumine my heart, O Master, to understand the Gospel. But we also believe you cannot read it as private interpretation. There's a community of faith. Right. There's a history of interpretation. There are holy people who shed blood for who this Jesus is. And that, know, and that and, in essence, will show us who Jesus Christ yes, is. absolutely. Right. Father Thomas, as always, thank you. We'll have you yeah. back again. I hope so. Well, there are over a hundred different descriptions of Jesus in the New Testament, and certainly there's one of them that can be close to you for whenever you need him. If you liked Orthodoxy Now today, we hope that you'll continue to watch it on Comcast On Demand or here on the Christian Associates Channel 95 in the city of Pittsburgh. And if you'd like to listen to Orthodoxy Now on the radio, you can do that at WEDO 810 on your AM dial on Wednesday mornings at 9.30. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Koylin Nassar. <laughs>